Ever wondered why your slice's print time calculation can be so unreliable? Well today we're going to look at the reasons why, as well as how to fix it. This is something that sounds like it should be quite simple. We import a 3D model into our slicer, the slicer knows how big the object is, and how fast the printer will be moving, and can calculate an expected print time duration. But you've probably noticed that quite often it's completely wrong. So why is this? Well, let's dig deeper. We know that a 3D printer produces an object layer by layer. So if we take the duration of each layer and add them together, that will equal the total print time. However, on most objects, the surface area for each layer can differ greatly. So we can't calculate the print time for one layer and then multiply it by the total layers to achieve our overall time estimate. It's simply too unreliable. If we change our G-code preview from feature type to speed, which is supported by most slicers, we can see that the slicer knows exactly how fast each move is. And this gives us a clue as to how the print time is actually calculated. Here I've taken a simple calibration cube and scaled it up to be 100 millimeters long, which will make the next section easier to understand. We click slice and on the speed preview, we can see that our exterior wall should be 50 millimeters per second. Now let's look inside the G code for the same section. We can see that we're looking at the external perimeter and that the four walls are represented on these four lines and each of them is roughly 100 millimeters. For instance, Y moves from 67 to 167. We can also see that before these lines, the feed rate is set at 3000 millimeters per minute. And if we divide this value by 60 to get millimeters per second, we can see that our expected speed of 50 millimeters per second is in place. To get a time estimate from this, we need some basic maths. And the formula for speed is distance divided by time, which we can rearrange with some algebra to be time equals distance divided by speed. Now we substitute in the values from our example, distance being 100 millimeters and the speed being 50 millimeters per second, and that gives us an estimated time of two seconds for each of these external perimeters. Each individual extrusion that makes up our 3D print has a distance as well as a feed rate or speed value. And each of these is listed in the G code. So what the slicer can do is go through line by line, see the distance traveled as well as the speed, calculate the time for individual movements, add these all together for every single individual line of G code, and arrive at an estimated printing time, in this case, a bit over 10 hours. Sometimes this estimate works out quite well. We can see this file was estimated for 50 minutes and took just under 49. It is common, however, for the print time estimates to be quite optimistic. For example, this print job was meant to take 12 and a quarter hours, but we can see that 6% in, it's been going for an hour and still has over 14 hours left. That's an extreme example, so let's look at this pot of greed predicted to be nine and a half hours, but actually over 10, or this 3D Benchy predicted for an hour and 39, actual print time an hour 53, which is 14% longer than expected. With my really fast printers, it actually goes in the opposite way. For instance, the slicer estimated just over two hours, but this file was completed in only an hour and 34 minutes. As you can see on this machine, this discrepancy is consistent. There's a number of reasons why this seemingly straightforward time calculation is off. Some of them obvious, some of them not so much. Let's start at the beginning, quite literally, with the start G code. Here we have commands to activate the heated bed, home the printer, as well as run ABL. Finally, a command to heat up the hot end, and all of these sequences will take a variable amount of time from printer to printer. Some printers move incredibly slow while homing and during auto bed leveling. For instance, this CR10 Smart is possibly the slowest printer I've ever seen home, and the slicer just sees G28 with no way of knowing how long the homing will take, especially keeping in mind that the printer's position is unknown before homing. The same goes for auto bed leveling. Some printers run it, some don't, and there's a lot of variation in how long it takes, depending on the feed rate set in the firmware, the resolution of the grid, and how many readings are taken for each point. Again, the slicer sees a single line of G-code and has no way of calculating how long it will actually take when the print starts. This same pattern continues for the time it takes to heat up the bed and the nozzle. Different printers take different amount of times, depending on the temperatures that are set, whether the heaters have been PID auto-tuned or not, how powerful the heaters are, as well as the ambient and starting temperatures. The slicer has no way of accounting for this variation. What happens in the start G-code is really low-hanging fruit. 
because the bulk of our discrepancy comes from acceleration values. When we were doing our earlier calculation, we made the assumption that the feed rate would be instantly reached, and by the same token, the print head would instantly stop at the other end of the movement. The reality is, is that acceleration greatly dictates how long each movement actually takes. In fact here the acceleration is so low that the target speed of 120mm per second is never reached. Here the acceleration is increased, but still not particularly fast. We can hit our target feed rate, but we can see the start and the end of each move is gradual. Finally, a more traditional acceleration value, and the overall movements are much faster to complete. This very clear example is the same G-code and therefore feed rates on both sides, the only difference is the acceleration values. If the printer's acceleration value is very low, the slicer is likely to predict a print duration that's much faster than real life. And if the printer's acceleration values are very fast, the slicer is likely to estimate a print duration that's longer than reality, just like we saw with my earlier example. Further complicating things is a parameter related to acceleration that depending on firmware is called jerk, junction deviation, square corner velocity, or maximum instantaneous speed change. To look at acceleration by itself is too simplistic. And if we look at this very handy acceleration calculator on the Prusa website, we can see that for these given parameters, we accelerate up to speed, maintain that speed, and then come to a standstill. But that's the problem. When we're 3D printing, each extrusion rarely starts with a speed of zero and rarely finishes with a speed of zero. For our cube, we would expect to slow down for these 90 degree corners, but not come to a standstill. And for a shape that's much closer to circular, we would expect very little slow down because the angles are so shallow. How much the print head slows down to corner, and therefore how much acceleration is involved, will depend on how sharp the angle of the corner is, and whatever we've set in our firmware. These parameters have subtle differences, but they all work in more or less the same way, and it's a variable that makes calculating the estimated print time much more complicated. Finally, some factors that don't necessarily affect every printer. If you have a dual extrusion, IDEX or tool changer machine, the time that it takes to switch between tool heads will be variable, especially if there's some sort of heating time to get the nozzle back up to temp when the new hot end is selected. Another consideration that will change print time are micro stutters, as seen here where the print head has paused and leaked out onto the surface of the vase. This can come from buffering problems, or as we're seeing here, power out protection pausing to write to the SD card every few seconds. It might not seem like much, but all of these little pauses will add up over the duration of the print. One possible gotcha is running into the firmware safety limits for speed and acceleration. Let's say you raise your speed in the slicer, and you raise it above the limits as set in the firmware. The firmware will limit the movement speed, and the print will take longer than the slicer thinks. Finally, if your printer is running firmware retraction, the slicer will output G10 and G11 G codes and has no way of knowing how fast or slow the retraction process is as stored on the printer's firmware. So we have a range of factors that throw off our calculation, with acceleration and jerk or its equivalent being the most important. The good news is that we can fix this. The best way to get the slicer's time estimate more accurate is to give the slicer enough information to calculate it properly. For Marlin firmware, we can access feed rate, acceleration and jerk values from the LCD menu under configuration. Alternatively, we can connect via terminal and send M503 and look for those very same values. For other firmware such as RepRap or Clipper, your printer configuration file will have these listed. Now we head to the slicer, but how much we can do depends on what slicer we're using. Simplify 3D, for instance, uses preset acceleration and jerk values so if your machines are close to this, the time estimate will be fairly accurate, but if your values differ, there's nothing built into the software to let you adjust this, and your estimates are going to be off. Prusa Slicer and Super Slicer, in my opinion, have the best handling of this. Here I've sliced a Benchy with the default settings, and it's giving me an estimate of 1 hour and 45. But if we come to Printer Settings and then Machine Limits, we can change this from Ignore to Use for Time Estimate. We can now enter all of the settings from our machine, here I'm just changing one to show that this works. If we re-slice, we can see that the slower acceleration value I used is factored into the estimate and the time is adjusted accordingly. And if we want the slicer to control these settings itself, we can change it to emit to G-code and then all of these values we have here will be inserted into the start G-code to override what's set in the firmware. Super Slicer has the same options in the same place, but also adds a time estimation compensation for non-Marlin and Lurch firmware so if you notice your times are off by the same factor, 
you can change the percentage here to make the print estimates more accurate. Now let's look at Cura, slicing a Benchy with the default settings for an estimated time of 1 hour and 50 minutes. If we come to our settings and search for acceleration, we'll have a button that says enable acceleration control. And when we tick it, we can input the settings from our printer. The same goes if we search for jerk and tick enable jerk control. This will insert values into the G-code throughout the print, overriding what's set in the firmware. And as we might expect, after lowering the acceleration, the print time estimate is increased to match. If we want the calculation improved, but without affecting the G-code, we need to come to the marketplace and search for an install printer settings by field of view. After we do this, we'll have a new section in our settings with fields to insert the settings from our firmware. Any changes we make here will be used during the calculation to make it more accurate. Beyond our slicer, we have some other tricks available, such as in RepRap firmware. If we come to the jobs tab, we can right click on any job and go to simulate file. The G code will then be interpreted, but using the machine's acceleration and jerk settings, calculating the time for each layer. And don't worry, it doesn't happen in real time, but it's certainly not instant. When the simulation completes, we'll have our predicted time, not including warm up time. Finally, if you're using Octoprint, there's a plugin called Print Time Genius that I've covered before. What makes this plugin special is that it monitors how long your printer takes to print, adjusting its time estimate mid print, and refining it over time so as you add new files, it's able to offer a more accurate prediction as to how long they'll take. Some people might not care about how accurate the slicer's time estimate is, but I say you should fix it, especially considering it's not that hard and you never know when you'll be 3D printing for an important deadline. If I've missed a trick, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.